who has ever heard or said, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because whatever, but if most of us have probably heard God just wants your money, maybe we've said this ourselves, like God or the church, you know what? They're just after your money. They're just after your pocketbook. Like they're just after your money. That's what that's all about. And if you've ever been in that conversation, that can be um, a little bit uncomfortable. It can be difficult because we're like, well, it's not that. That's not it at all. But that's a prevalent mindset that we hear around our culture and around our world. So we're having this conversation because I think it's really, really important to talk about this perspective. Uh, money is too big of a deal to not talk about. Uh, last week, we started this series off and we talked a little bit about what a steward actually is like, that God has entrusted us, this mindset, this perspective, that God has entrusted us everything that we have in our hands. He's entrusted to us our life. He's entrusted to us our energy, our resources, everything. And he's just asked us to do something with it. He doesn't tell us exactly you have to, it has to look a certain way, but he's like, hey, do something with what I've given you. Now, at the end of last week, um, the, one of the fun parts of this message that I really love, um, I asked some, for some volunteers, and I had three become up, and there's three envelopes given. Uh, one had $10, and then two had $20. And I asked and charged uh, some volunteers to do something with that $20, $10, and $20. Do something with it. That you were a steward of Canyon's Church. This was our money, but you were in charge of doing something with it. Uh, that would be kind in our community. So this is what happened. This is amazing. Uh, one, of, one of them took their $20 and actually bought their co-workers coffee. And then in the conversation, when she handed these out, she said, um, by the way, this is from our church. They don't want anything for, in return. They've asked me to be a good steward of what they entrusted to me. And our church wants people in our community to know that God is for you, that God loves you, regardless of what you believe in where you're at. Uh, so that was a, a great conversation that she's able to have with some people that don't even go to church, that they got free coffee. That's cool. Uh, somebody else took the $20 and added to it, I believe, like $30 and made it 50 of their own money. Uh, and this, this person, this is incredible too, um, this person is uh, connected with the high school here in Clarkston. And one of the cheerleaders uh, that goes there is, shall we say, um, doesn't have a lot. And so there's a trip that the cheerleaders were going on up to Spokane, and all the other cheerleaders are going to go shopping. They're going to have a great time. This person handed her the money and just said, look, I want you to make sure that you feel accepted, comfortable, that you're not isolated in this moment, but you're included in this moment. God wants you to know that you are loved, and he's providing for you in this way. That's amazing to have a young person experience that in their life. Um, the third and final person, and I joke about this because he... Um, sitting right up here in the front row, but uh, he got the $10, and he was, uh, I told him it was given uh, based on ability, but um, <laughs> he proved me wrong. Uh, he took the $10, added $5 to it, bought some yarn, and then utilized not just the resources that he had, but then also a skill and ability that he's uh, grown and developed over time. He knitted some hats, and they're amazing. If you've ever, they're amazing. They're incredible. Um, and then he put them up for sale on Facebook, uh, charged $15 a hat. Well, very, very quickly, they were gone instantly. Um, and then some other people asked, well, could you make me one too? And so he added to them. And then other people just started to volunteer to give money because what he was doing with his money, his, um, his dad recently was diagnosed with leukemia, a form of leukemia. And all of the proceeds from that was going to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Um, and so people jumped on board, and they're just like, we want to help, we want to make a difference. And it's incredible to think that that $10 actually turned to almost $100 that was donated in a very, very quick time. This is what it looks like to be a good steward, Th that you have something that's been entrusted to you, you do something with what you have, and God multiplies it. God does something more than you thought you could have. And that's incredible, and that's amazing. And that's where we're leading today. We are stewards. This is, you know, where we kind of left off. We are stewards. But the question that we asked, th or we're asking this week is not just what we are, but why we are. Why should we live like we're a steward? Why is this a priority? Why is this, why is this my responsibility to live like a steward? So that's where we're going today. Has anyone ever been fired from your job? You ever been fired? Uh, again, you don't have to raise your hand. Some of us are like, yeah, I've been fired. It doesn't feel good. 
Others are like, yeah, I was fired and it was the best thing that happened to me. <laughs> like, that's, it's amazing that story, like that can go two different directions. Sometimes the firing actually opens up a different door that you did not realize you needed to walk through. But today's parable, we're looking at a parable that Jesus taught. It's about opportunity loss. Like you have an opportunity, you have something in your hands, and then there's a window of time before that window, or at the end of the window, it closes. That opportunity disappears. Jesus, I love, I love parables because they're made-up stories that Jesus made up, and he uses them to prove a point, to give an example of what you know, a certain thing is like. And a lot of them are, this is what the kingdom of God is like, or this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. This is, ultimately, this is a picture of God we are included. Somehow we are in the, the parable as well, the story as well. And then there's a topic, like this is how we engage between God, us, and this topic. Of the about 40 parables that Jesus taught, almost a third of those are about money. So this is not a small topic. This is not a small deal. In fact, there's a study that shows um, <laughs> the number one thought, the number one topic that everybody on average has most of the time is money. This is not a survey that was done just with junior high boys. Just clear that up. Uh, Yeah, that's Xbox. Um, No, but most of the time, all of us think about money more than any other thing, how we're going to save it, how we're going to spend it, what we need to do for our future, the regrets that we've had of our past. Like Money is one of the main primary ideas and thoughts that we have in our head. If If it's taking up that much time of our thought, energy, and space, If Jesus taught about this, you know, a third of the time of his parables, I think that money needs to be talked about in a healthy, hopefully healthy manner at church to help give us perspective of what it's like uh, within a a mindset of what God's perspective is on money. So if we want to know what it's like to be truly rich, then we're going to have to figure out and adopt God's perspective on money. So this is the parable that we're going to look at. It's found in Luke chapter 16, verse 1. Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. Now, before I get too far on this, uh, previously in, in Luke chapter 15, Jesus also gave a bunch of parables, a bunch of stories that he taught from. Uh, in the NIV version, there's kind of a conjunction that's missing, actually. In, in the other version, it's there, and it's, it's like Jesus also taught. Jesus also said. So this is connected to the previous three parables. The other parables were the the parable of the lost coin, the parable of the lost sheep, and the parable of the prodigal son. This parable that we're going to look at actually is in contradiction. It's in contrast to the parable of the the prodigal son, where the prodigal son, he squandered his wealth and the opportunity. This is actually an opportunity that the window's closing, and someone utilizes it to the best of their ability. So this this is a big idea that Jesus is teaching. He's teaching his disciples. There's this rich man. This, just FYI, this is going to be God. In the, in the story, whose manager, us, in the story, was accused of wasting his possessions, which is not a great spot to be. So uh, verse 2, he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, because you cannot be manager any longer. Opportunity lost. He's taking the job away from him. He's, he's losing the opportunity that he had. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. You ever had this moment where you're losing something? You're like, you start talking out loud. What am I going to do now? That's like the first thing. Well, what am I going to do? Like this was, this is what I had confidence in. This is what I had my, you know, my level of confidence was in this income, in this role, in this job. And now that is disappearing. That's leaving. I'm not going to have that anymore. What am I going to do? He continues on. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg, and then he has this epiphany. He has this like light bulb moment, turns on. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. Like, okay, now we're thinking straight. This is the direction we need to go. There's something that he can do that is productive for his future. He's not just going to be upset about today. He's doing something proactive about his future. Uh, In verse 5, so he called in each of his master's debtors, and he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? Which is, I mean, this might be part of the problem. <laughs> if he doesn't know what the, the person owed his master, it's like, okay, case in point, figure that out first. Uh, but he asked him, how much do you owe my, owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. Because you do. I mean, 
who doesn't own 900 gallons of olive oil. Uh, anyway, the manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. Cut it in half. Just make your bill 450, cut it in half. Uh, continue on. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. And he told him, take your bill and make it 800. I don't know why it's different. Like one guy gets half of it off, the other guy gets 20%. I don't know. But he does, regardless, he does something in order to open the door for himself in the future. And this leads to the question, the primary, like the, the tension in the story, how is the master going to respond when he hears what the manager, who's going to lose his job, is doing? Like, how is he going to respond? Is he going to be upset with him? I mean, before he was just going to lose his job. He's, if he's losing money on this deal, then is he going to lose his life? Is that what this is going to lead to? What's the response going to be from the manager's quick and decisive actions? Verse 8. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. Shrewdly is a word that we do not use nearly enough in our culture, in our society. Shrewdly is, is using the, the full capacity of your intellect to make a quick, clever, decisive uh, judgment on something. It's, it's what we think of when we think of like a, a shrewd businessman. Like this is someone that just sees the picture and sees what's ahead and just makes a very quick judgment. Yep, this needs to change. That needs to happen. Cut ties quickly. Like just move on. Make the decision and move on from it. This is a shrewd decision. And Jesus actually praises this man for his shrewd behavior. He was stewarding what he had in his hands before it was not in his hands any longer. And this is what Jesus was praising. This is what Jesus is pointing to in the story. This is good behavior. This is what we want to do. Recognize what's in your hands, and there's an end date to what's in your hands. Like, it's going to be taken from you at some point in time. What are you going to do with it? Don't just sit on it. What are you going to do with it in order to provide for yourself today and what, uh, you know, what comes tomorrow. So this is stewardship as a whole. This is what we talked about last week. Stewardship is using God-given money and resources for God-given goals and objectives. When you recognize that it is the master's, that it is not yours, you've been entrusted with something, your life, your resources, your talent, your ability, you've been, been entrusted with something, and as a good steward, we're to find out, figure out what God's goals and objectives are and then utilize what's in our hands for those purposes. Uh, continuing on in verse, the, the rest of verse 8. For the people of this world are more shrewd. This is interesting. People in this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. It's like the light bulb turned on. Like people that are following Jesus, he's calling the people of the light. People that are following me are not as shrewd as people in the world. He's contrasting the rest of the world compared to the people that are following him. He's like, this isn't... This isn't helpful. We want people to be shrewd. We want people to be wise with their finances, wise with their opportunities, wise with what is presented to them. Because Jesus doesn't want people that follow him to be taken advantage of. He doesn't want people that follow him to minimize profits. There's, like, there's something in our mindset that be, if you're a good Christian. If you're like, if I follow Jesus, then that means I have to let everybody walk all over me. If I follow Jesus, then that means I can't make too much money because making too much money means, you know, everybody thinks that I'm going to be taking advantage of other people. If I make too much money, if I'm too wealthy, if I have too much, then obviously I've done some crooked things or some things that don't really line up with my core beliefs. Like I've, I've cheated somewhere, some way, somehow. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 it's not, it's not that at all. I want you to be shrewd. I want you to profit as much as possible. Here, here's, here's a thought that I had while I was preparing for this. Someone is going to profit. It might as well be people that have hearts aligned with God's. But there's a lot of money in this world. There's a lot of resources in this world. Don't you think that it's more beneficial, that it's more benevolent, that it's more, you know, generous in our communities if it's actually people that have their hearts in line with God than the other way around? That's just my thought. I think that God wants us to profit so that we can be even more impactful in our communities, even more impactful in the relationships that we have 
with the people around us. Continuing on verse 9. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, which is not what my mama taught me. <laughs> Let's be honest. Next week, I'm going to start a, you know, a single conversation that's about what my mom taught me. This is not what my mom taught me. She didn't tell me, you know, when you go in life, make sure that you use money to buy friends. That's not what she told me. She also didn't tell me that, yeah, let people buy your friendship. That's also not what she told me. This is not what our moms teach us. And yet this is exactly what Jesus is saying. It's like, you, you have something right now. Utilize it to gain influence. What we have can be utilized, not just for our today, but for our tomorrow with others. Use what we have in order to influence our tomorrow. I can, the rest of verse 9. Uh, gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. You see, there's going to be a day when we're no longer here. Like, like there's a day where we're no longer here. And in that day, there's going to be people around you. You're going to see others. And hopefully, if we do what we should today, we will be welcomed by the people around us then. And they will say things like, I would not be here if it wasn't for your impact and your influence. And that all comes when we utilize, when we, when we leverage what we have that is in our hands in order to make an impact in others' lives around us. You know, a couple things that we can pull out from, from this idea. Certain things last. Wealth is not one of those. It's, it's only here for a moment. It's not going to be here forever. It's in your hands and then it's gone. So you better use what you can today in order to influence your tomorrow. Make sure that there's something attached to what you have. That you can set yourself up for success. That you can set yourself up for something in return later on. And then the other thought here is use your temporary wealth for matters of eternal worth. So Jesus is teaching us that money is evil. No, not at all. We get that wrong. We get that wrong. No, money is actually a tool, and it's a really good tool. It's a really good resource, and it's not just used for more accumulation. It's used for more impact. It's used for more influence. It's used in order to set other people up for success, not just financial, but spiritual, relational, in their walk with God. Their, their ability to walk towards a loving Heavenly Father can be funded with what we have. So wealth is a wonderful tool. It is a horrible God. It is not a good God to worship, to serve. You're supposed to utilize that in order to worship God. Right? That's how, that's how we worship, with what's in our hands. Utilize that in order to worship God rather than worshiping what's in our hands. Verse 10. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Joey, I'm looking at you. $10. Yeah, there we go. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. If you are a manager of people, if you're a business owner, if you oversee people, you know this. I mean, it, it's so prominent. You can see it very clearly. When you trust something with a little bit, you know that that leads, that's a test. That leads to trusting them with more and more and more. But if you trust them with a little and they squander it, they're not trustworthy, <laughs> I'm not going to continue to fund that. I'm not going to continue to invest in that person financially with resources that are going to disappear. I'm going to put them elsewhere where they're going to multiply, where they're going to grow, where they're going to increase and create more of an impact. Verse 11. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? The point here, worldly wealth passes away. This is just for a time. What are the true riches that God is trusting to us or making available to us. And how we deal with our today is in direct correlation with what we're going to be potentially entrusted with in our tomorrow, in our eternity. Verse 12, and if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? This is not how this works. People see this. This is, this is wisdom that is acted out. If you're trustworthy with a small, he'll, be, he'll increase what he is entrusting to you. Verse 13, no one, and this is possibly one of the like more famous verses, no one can serve two masters. 
Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. We can't do it. Those are two competing, two competing things. Because remember what, what we talked about a little bit last time, that God just wants your, not your money. God just wants your heart. God wants your heart. And Jesus knew that, that your heart is connected to your stuff. The chief com- competitor for your heart is not anything. It's not like the, it, we often think like, oh, it's, it's the devil. The devil's chief competitor for your heart. No, we're not tempted, most of us at least, most of us are not tempted like, ooh, am I going to serve the devil today? Like, so that, that's not a thing that, we, that we're weighing out. Like, I don't know, it sounds like a good idea. No, no one's sitting here thinking that. But our stuff gets connected to our heart. Our stuff, our wealth, the accumulation of wealth, that is what steals our heart away. And that's what God is after, your heart, not your stuff. He's after your heart. So he's asking us to be shrewd, be a shrewd steward so you can be a generous giver. And this generosity piece, this is how you disconnect your heart from your stuff. When you first and foremost say, you know what? It's not mine. I'm going to recognize that it's not mine to start with, and I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to give some of it away to make sure that it is not sticking to my heart. I'm just going to give some of it away. I'm going to be generous. I'm going to give it away. I'm going to give something to somebody else that can make an impact that can make an impact in there today, in their tomorrow, and it's an investment in influence for my tomorrow as well. Now, this, this next question might be, this might be the most important question that you ever hear in your entire life. Did I, did I oversell that? I don't think so. This is, honestly, this in my perspective, this is, this is one of the biggest questions that you will ever hear. Do you believe there is life after this life? Do you believe that? If you don't believe that, I'm going to say everything that I just talked about, do the opposite. If you don't, if you think that this life is all that there is and then it's over and it's done and you have no more existence left after this life, then by all means, go out and be as selfish as you possibly can. Don't give anything away. Accumulate everything that you possibly can to win life because when it's over, it's over. However, if If you believe that there's life after this, if you believe that there's something in your existence that happens when we die and we move on to something that's next, the ramifications of this life echo into our future, into whatever that is. Question being, how's your eternity retirement doing? Like that's the the idea, that's the premise here that we're talking about. I believe that that next life lasts longer. I believe that that next life matters more than this very quick existence that we have here today. And we have this. This is a test. This is an opportunity that we have to invest in our future, to invest in other futures around us. And it all starts with recognizing that it's not ours to begin with. It's God's. God has entrusted this to us. So what are we going to do with it? What are we going to do with it? So we're going to talk about giving. Uh, some of you, like, you've been thinking about, like, this is broad context. There's a lot of big ideas. I get at 30,000 feet. You just want the practical. Okay, how do I do this? How do, how do I implement generosity in my life? There's a teaching that we've done here for quite a while. Uh, this actually started from the first time I heard it was with Andy Stanley years ago. Uh, North Point Church back in Atlanta. We're partners with them. Uh, And this is the three P's of giving. So the first P is priority. Most people, most people in their life live this way with their finances. That, That they live first with their money. They spend whatever they want. Then they remember, oh, I should probably save a little bit Like, oh my goodness, tomorrow exists. I have to do something about my tomorrow. They save a little bit. And then the last piece is their giving. The last piece is their giving. It's like, okay, if I get down to it, if I can find some change on the floorboards of my vehicle, then I'll give that. Like if if it hasn't, you know, if it doesn't have a home yet, if it's just hanging out in my pocket one day and I'm like, oh, I should give this to someone. Like that's the last thing that we think about. The priority giving though, if you really believe that there is a life after this, 
and that what we do today echoes and has ramifications in our tomorrow. If we really think that that's true, then the priority has to shift. First and foremost, and you've heard me say this before probably, that we give first. We give first. That's the first thing we do with it. That's the priority. That's not a secondary, and that's not at the bottom rung uh, of, of how we engage with finances. No, that's the priority. We give first, and then we save second. We are wise. We are shrewd with our money. We save second, and then we live on the rest. We make sure that the, the rest part is budgeted, right? So we, we are under control. We're providing everything that we need to for our families. We know what that number is, but we make sure that that, as far as the priority goes, that's the adjustable piece, not the giving piece, not even the saving piece. Second, second P in the three Ps of giving is percentage. And this is one that, you know, this is a very good conversation to have with your spouse or your partner or someone that's wise around you. Um, because you need to decide ahead of time how much you want to give. Because otherwise, you won't give what you think you should. Like if you had a conversation with yourself separate, not at church, but at home where the pressure's off, you just had a conversation like looking at our funds, what should we do with our money? How much should we give? This is a percentage conversation. It's not even a dollar amount. It's a percentage of our in income. You know, if you go biblically, that's 10%. That's what, the, that's what biblically we're asked to do, that we give 10%. That's a starting point. For some of us, 10%, let's be honest, for some of us, 10%, that's not, even, that's not even really that generous. Like if we think about it, the amount of money that we have, the amount of income that we have, it's like, I, okay. Like I, I, here's the American dream, right? Our income increases throughout our life. That's the American dream. And as our, as our income increases, there's like a parallel line of our spending. And it goes the exact same. It's the exact same line. We want to spend as much as we possibly can. The difference when you follow Jesus is not that you're trying to accumulate and save up everything worldly wealth for you today. It's that you find a standard of living, right? If you follow Jesus, the goal shouldn't be an astronomical standard of living, but an increased standard of giving. Once, you, once you've decided what your standard of give, uh, living is, what it should be, what's healthy, what's wise, I mean, we think of, we think of like professional athletes like, oh my goodness, how do you spend even that much money? Like there's, there's the decimal points a few spots over from what anything I've dreamt of seeing in my bank account. How do you spend that much money? It's, it's work. Also, if we think about it in, in those terms, there is a moment when we have to decide what's the standard of living that is acceptable, that's appropriate, that's healthy, that's wise in light of what we just talked about today. Right? That, that we have been entrusted something and at the end of this life, we will no longer have control of it. And what we do today matters tomorrow. So what's the standard of living that we need to be at? And then what is the amount of increase that we can give, that generosity increases higher and more than our standard of living? Finally, the third P is progressive. And this is pretty simple. Uh, like I just said, some of you, like the 10% might not be. I mean, 10% of a million dollars, you're like, okay, can I live on, can I live on 900,000? I think most of us probably could figure that out, right? That's a, that's a number most of us could figure out. But if you're at a different spot and you're like 10%, I'm doing the math, that, that means that my electric bill or my water bill is not getting paid this month. I get that. That's real life. If that's the spot that you're at, then I would say don't, don't do that. Don't put yourself in a hole like that. However, pick a number, pick a percentage. Maybe it's 3%. You're like, okay, I could give, I could give 3% of what my income is. And if that's where you're at, then figure out how to be progressive. That the next year, maybe you try to bump 3% up to 4%. Like I said, in our life, typically, what we hope for, what we work toward, is that our income increases, right? So in this life, if our income increases, the percentage of our giving should also increase as well. We talked about this last week that it's, it's, um, it's a very, it, I think it's sad, it's very real. The statistics show that the more income that you have, the smaller the percentage that you give. The, and the less income that you have, the higher the percentage that you give. 
I think that needs to be flip-flopped. I think that should be the other way around. So I just, I'm asking some hard questions. I know that this is super fun, super exciting. You're like, this is exactly what I needed. No, that's, nobody's, no one's really excited about this. However, I also think that there's a value here because this is a conversation that we, we know we need to have. We know we need to engage with this. And yet it's so easy to ignore. It's so easy to like just cover it up. It's so easy to move on quickly from it. Man, that was a good message in church today. What are we having for lunch? Like that's the, what, how can I get out of this conversation? How can I get out of this future idea? Like how, how do we move on from this as quickly as possible? But my hope for you is that you are and you become a shrewd steward. Be a shrewd steward so you can be a generous giver. If there's life after this life, it lasts longer and matters more than this one. I'm going to put a, I'm not going to put a pin in it. This is the end of the message. This is it. Uh, I do have some discussion questions for you, though, because I hope, I hope that you continue this conversation. If you're married, have this conversation with your spouse. If you're not married, figure out how to separate yourself and have some time alone to actually work through some of these questions. Why? Because this isn't just an idea. This isn't just a thought. This isn't just a, like, oh, I'm really glad that I had that thought and then move on with my life. No, there's, there needs to be some type of response to this. If you're, if you're new to church, for, let me say this. Probably should have said this at the beginning. If you're new to church, if you're not even, like, you don't follow Jesus, you're not even sure about the whole Christianity thing, let me just take the pressure off of you. I, I'm not asking you to do this. I, I think that these are healthy. I think this is good. I think that you will find in life that the moments that you can trust God the most are when we actually see what he does with what we offer to him. In my life, when I was growing up, I'll tell you one story, and then we'll, I'll add this. This will be the last story. Um, in my life, I was in Bible college. I grew up in a, in a Christian home. Um, I was taught very, very early that you give a tithe. So I remember being in like second grade, and I was doing chores around the neighborhood, and I would get like $10, and my parents taught me, okay, of that 10, you give a dollar to church. That's what you do. That's what we're supposed to do. We follow Jesus to what we do. So from a very early age, this is just like, this is what I, how I saw the world. I recognized that it was God's first. He was entrusting this to me. And I responded in kind because he loved me first. So I'm like, okay, I can do that. So that's just my mentality. I go through, you know, high school, I graduate, go to Bible college, down in Bible college. After the first year, I decided that I was going to intern. I don't know if you've ever interned at a church before. It's not a lucrative moment for you. Like it's not, there's not a whole lot attached to it. I interned all summer long. I did not have money for school the next semester. I just felt like I was supposed to. I was like, okay, I think this is what I'm supposed to do. At the end, my pastor's like, no, don't worry about it. At the end, we'll take an offering for you. Like we'll try to help you out. And that got me a plane ticket home and then back to school. That's what that did. So I went home for a week, like the money was gone. And then I came back to school. I was like, okay, now, <laughs> now what? Like, how long before the school figures out that I have no money and I've stopped paying and they're going to kick me out anyway? And I got back to school and I got a job as quickly as I could. I worked on campus. And the first paycheck was actually, I started about a halfway through the pay period. So my first paycheck was going to be one and a half times uh, a normal pay period. So it was going to be the biggest check that I ever received at that job. And I remember this moment praying in a vehicle. I was in a car and I was like, I, I don't know why I was praying this. It, this is one of those dangerous prayers, but I was like, God, I love you, I trust you. And he's like, okay, well, then why don't you give the money that you're getting from that check? I thought, like, tithe, I'll tithe on it. Yeah, 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 I'm good with that. And it is very clear, no, 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 all of it. I thought, well, God, that doesn't make sense because I'm making money so I can go to Bible college. Like, don't I get some reward for that? I, I don't, like, this is making it more difficult for me. I want to... <laughs> I was not a very good Bible college student because I didn't have a guitar or a computer. How are you supposed to be a good Bible college student without a guitar and a computer? And I didn't have a car either. I was in someone, I was borrowing a vehicle that I was praying in. So I was like, God, I don't think, I had this argument. God, I don't think you understand the whole picture here. I know you're busy. There's a lot of people. I get that. Here's my scenario. If you don't remember, I need to be a good Bible college student, guitar, computer, car. This is my first paycheck. I don't have anything in my bank account. I said, no, do you trust me? Oh, that was the wrong question or the right question. Because I knew in that moment, either I trusted God or I didn't. And if I didn't trust God, I didn't need to, 
I didn't need to go to Bible college anyway. <laughs> I needed to find something else to do. So I gave, I gave my paycheck. And I'll be honest with you, it was the most random and weird semester that I ever had. Um, I, I was contacted by family members, and they just said, and I didn't tell anybody that I was doing this. I didn't tell anybody what my, you know, the state of my financial situation was. Family members, hey, we were just thinking about you. Here's an extra check. Hope you have a good semester. I received a scholarship from school that I did not know existed, nor did I apply for. Explain that one. I don't get it. I don't understand it. And again, no one knew my financial situation. Somehow it worked out. By the end of the year, I had a guitar. <laughs> I had a computer. And the next year, I got my car. That was the best financial semester I had my entire four years at Bible college. I'm, all, I, I'm saying that not because I, I promise that everything's going to work out and it's going to look exactly like you want it to. I'm saying that because, because God is trustworthy. And what we do now, when, when God entrusts something to us, he's going to take care of you. It might look different than you think it should, but there is a tomorrow that God sees clearer than you do. And he knows what's in it, and he knows what you're able to do or not do tomorrow. And he knows that if you are trustworthy with what he puts in your hands, you're going to be just fine. You're going to be just fine. So I know this is a lot. I know that this is difficult. I know that money is like, that's the thing. Don't invite someone to church on money days. Don't talk about that. Like, we don't like it. I get that. And it's also in our minds all the time. This is a driving force in our world. We have to have this conversation because... Our relationship with God is more important than the accumulation in our bank account. Our tomorrow and the life after this one is more important than our life today. This one echoes in tomorrow. It's longer and it's more, it matters more. So that's enough for me. Discussion questions. Number one, why is Jesus better, a better God than money? How deeply do you believe that? Number two, how does money want to enslave you? Number three, if Jesus set your budget, what would be different? Just brush by that one. When it comes to being a priority percentage and progressive giver, what needs to change in your life? But th this conversation is not meant to just be a thought and attitude and mindset. It should be action that follows. It should be application here. I'm going to pray. We're going to get out of here. And um, come on back next week. Like I said, next week we're starting a new, uh, new message. It's just a standalone. But it is something that my mom taught me and I think is really important. So we want to come back to that. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything that you do for us. First and foremost, you are a big God. You are a good God and you love us. You know us. You care for us. You are for us. God, you know, you know us better than we do. You know our circumstances better than we do. You know not only our past, our present, but also our future and what's going to happen tomorrow. You, you know, what, you know what, what hangs in the balance of a decision to trust you. What lies on the other side of that? That there can be a, a stronger relationship with you, and not only that, but there can be a, a different future for us and for the people that we can impact with what you've entrusted to us. God, we thank you for these opportunities. We thank you for what's in our hands. God, I pray that we wouldn't compare to other people what's in their hands, but we would simply look at what you've given us and we would ask the question, what can I do with this in order to make a difference? What can I do with this in order to draw people closer to you? A loving God who owns it all anyway and wants us and has gifted us the opportunity to make a difference in this world. God, we thank you for everything that you've done for us. We thank you for what you're going to do for us. We thank you for the opportunity that you're presenting us. And I pray that we would act with courage and boldness and wisdom. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here. See you next week. <laughs>